thank you very much, Chair, um, and welcome very much. Welcome to, I suppose, to our DCU research team, and I suppose uh, particularly to Professor uh, Higgins and Norman, Norman Higgins. Uh, I mean, it's fantastic to have the UNESCO chair here, I suppose, over the anti-bullying as well. Um, and I know that I've spoken, we've had Dr. Mazzoni present before us before, and I know, Darren, we've spoken, I suppose, as the rollout of the FUSE programme. So just to say thank you for your work and for your presentations at the very beginning of our, uh, I suppose, our research now into bullying. At, I suppose, you know, we've dealt with so many different groups. Um, I suppose the interesting part of your submissions, and thanks for the two detailed submissions that you put in. So I just have a number of questions, if I may, uh, put forward. So firstly, the audit. So the audit around, uh, the audit that we've mentioned or that you've recommended on the action plan on bullying, you, you mentioned that there's a statement, you know, that the principals now have a uh, mandate to go forward and to allocate staff. And I just, I suppose, to point to the, to what you've just pointed out here, that only 51% of schools have appointed a specific member of staff to investigate and tackle bullying in their schools. Less than half of the schools, 45% of research and identified a specific anti-bullying program to use in their school. So I could ask the uh, professor, uh, or, sorry, apologies. I hope I'm saying your name You're correctly. Okay. I was James. just checking yeah. it. Uh, it's James. <laughs> you, you have a you have a lot of uh, surnames there as well. So, Professor Norman, um, if I could just ask you in relation to an audit, what would that look like? Okay, so that's question number one. If I can ask Dr. Mairead Foodie uh, also, just in relation to the statistics, you mentioned a sample of 900 schools. Just the breakdown there between primary and post-primary in terms of the response that you got here in the statistics that you've given. Um, if I could ask. Darren, as the operations manager, just about the role of the school board and parents associations and what you've seen to date, um, who might answer this question best? It's to do with the rollout. We have at primary school level 3,242 primary schools right now, or according to 2019 statistics. We have 723 post-primary schools. Um, you know, that's covering over a million students at primary and post-primary level. How are we going to roll this out? quickly when I understand that you've done such great work, but it's only 127 schools, only 120. It's still wonderful, but how do we reach all of these students with this program, <clears throat> excuse me, with this FUSE program? So if I might ask for responses on that. Thank you very much. So I think the first question was was to me, Senator, um, in relation to the audit. Um, so I'll just answer that. The, the, so there, there, the audit that we're we're talking about is in relation to the action plan itself at a national level and the procedures. So the the they, they were published in 2013, and they haven't um, been updated since then. So the research that informed them. I mean, you remember at the time there was a, a very deep consultation with all the stakeholders uh, that took it took a lot of work to come up with that, that action plan and their procedures. Um, so we're saying that, you know, I've heard some people have asked for a new action plan or new procedures, but before we would go down that road, we would think we better to audit the um, national action plan to see how it measures up against more recent research and also the latest in terms of international practice around whole education approaches, such as what was what was published by um, UNESCO last year. Um, so that would be a, a task for the department to lead, I suppose, um, in terms of auditing that that um, with support from the likes of ourselves and others to audit that action plan and procedures and just measure see how it measures up today. You know, the guts of ten years after it was first put, it was first published. Uh, Professor, if I'm just may, but. Um how do we how do we evaluate how we support the schools to roll this out? Just from the sample that you've taken, you know, the schools haven't been able to implement this and it, it's been since 2013. So I suppose when you say audit, do you mean just audit, in other words, updating the, the strategy? Or is it an audit where we're literally going out to the schools and evaluating have they put these measures in place? Or if not, why not? So, yeah, so it's both. And um, so the audit is in terms of the document itself as a, as a guiding document for, for how schools would uh, uh, tackle bullying and cyberbullying. But then, as I also said, that we're recommending the further field work with the principals to try to understand why schools would would uh, would would be finding it difficult to implement the action plan and the procedures. Um, so th so there's a need for field work with the with the schools as well as auditing the the overall national document. Thank you very much, Professor. And I might just pose the last question to you as well, because I think perhaps it, it's most relevant to, to, well, if you had some ideas on it, how do we roll this out to more schools? Um, I don't know if you would just have a response to that, because 127 per year, although excellent, I'm sure, yeah. it's not going to ever meet uh, what we have nearly nearly the guts of four and a half thousand schools, both primary yeah. and post-primary. How is that going to be done? 
it's a huge task and will need additional resources um, like the resources that we have to roll out the program in its present form over the last two three years um, have been uh, considerable but but we will need more resources to be able to do it across all of the schools uh, we can be smart about how we do that we can arrange local committees we can arrange it on a county by county basis with local coordinators and so on uh, but the, the thing to remember is that what we're trying to do is bring about a change across the culture of the schools and a change in to how we understand bullying behavior so it, it, it will take time it won't be immediate um, but, but we need to plan for that and we need to resource it uh, appropriately. So in other words, would a regional approach be more suitable? So in other words, you've trained the trainer, you know, so in other words, I know you have the expert skill set in DCU, but surely there's a, a need here to roll that out so that we've got groups set up in regional areas to drive uh, connecting with these schools, because I don't see how it's feasible just at the numbers that you've mentioned now yeah. if we wanted to achieve this within the next three yeah. years. If, if we look at the Norwegian model, for example, they have um, they have regional educational authorities and each education authority has an action plan and has a has a, um, a coordinator for implementing the national legislation and action plan on bullying within a group of schools. So across the whole of Norway, there are these regional committees that are coordinated centrally, but they they have a local coordinator as well. So there absolutely has to be if if, if the um, if the policy is to be developed in a way that's sustainable within schools, then we have to do it in a way it can't be top down from a centralised place, and it has to be resourced accordingly. I just, I'd like to kick that question. If that's okay. Over to my colleague, Dr. Alan Gorman, who who uh, would talk can talk a bit more about, about uh, how so the policy might roll out. Mr. Heaney, I, I will ask Mr. Heaney to come in first. He had his hand up there, Mr. Heaney. Thank you, Chair. No problem. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, um, in relation to the uh, principals and parents' association involvement, just to answer that, um, there is a commitment at the very start when schools register for the programme that they will deliver it, that they will set up a committee and that they will follow through with the resources and delivery. Um, we provide also information for the principals to share with their board of management um, that the, the school is participating in this programme. Um, the to clarify the numbers there so 30 of those schools were po were primary and we we're in our first year of, of piloting the resources with primary so we wanted to take a phased approach to just to double check that the resources were appropriate and they worked and how we were tackling it was appropriate and um, in relation to the other schools uh, who are post primary i would uh, reiterate what um james has just said there in relation to regions that's the way to kind of broad broaden our reach across the whole country, uh, getting schools to work in clusters. The whole aim of the programme is to connect schools, parents and teachers, but also to empower the schools to be able to meet what's set out within the policy, uh, the National Action Plan and Procedures. So it's providing them with support, resources, a toolkit to try and do that. And I think if we can, um, COVID has been particularly good in the sense that we have now a lot of online options for training, um, which gives, has given us a broader reach across the country, which has been very helpful. Thank you. Um, Mr. O'Gorman. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Senator, and uh, thank you, James. Yeah, just in linking in as well with with, with what uh, James and both Darren were saying as well, there's a real importance as well of building up capacity within schools as well through a range of programmes, not just particularly one specific programme, but looking at the range of supports that we currently have in Ireland. So looking at, say, for example, building up leadership capacity, particularly early career principals, looking at the supports that are currently available to them through the Centre for School Leadership, through advisory bodies such as the PDST, the Inspectorate as well, and also then linking in with other kind of policy developments, key policy developments to support schools. For example, the inclusive education framework developed by the National Council for Special Education, uh, a very important um, do policy document there as well to support schools in that way as well. So it's important that you know we're building up capacity within schools, and as James said, it's just, it's it's top down, but it's bottom up as well. That schools have the agency to identify areas that they need to work on and address those areas in relation to what they need to address bullying as well. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you very much.